Well, Jody and I, we had a great time yesterday. It was just awesome to be here with so many couples and investing marriage. Hey, we're huge fans of this church here at Long Hollow. God is doing an amazing thing. Amen? Amen. Come on now. We love your pastor. We love, yeah, we can celebrate your pastor. Can we do that? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, uh, 12, verse 10, it says, outdo one another with honor. So let's really celebrate your pastor. Come on now. Thankful to God for him. And, you know, Robbie and I have known him for the past 10 years or so. And now let's just celebrate the woman who has to put up with him, Candy. Can you just outdo with honor there? Yeah, I'm telling you. Both of them, uh, Robbie came out in January and Candy came out to our church back in February in the winter and the cold months and they did, Robbie did our men's conference and she did our women's conference and you know your pastor, he walks in, it's below d- zero temperature, he's got a short sleeve shirt on. <laughs> now I purposely, it's September, I put a jacket on because I don't want to show off my muscles. But in all seriousness, we're huge fans of what God is doing here, and it's just a privilege for me to be able to speak with you today. Well, I got to tell you, I didn't become a Christian until I was 27 years old. And so it took me a while to get on board. And I remember when I was living in Arlington Heights, it's a northwest suburb of Chicago, and there was two guys that came knocking on my door. And I don't know if you know these guys or not, but... They wear white shirts, and they have black ties, and they kind of work through some neighborhoods. I can tell by the giggles they've worked through some neighborhoods around here, too. So it's not just limited to Chicago. These guys do a lot of traveling around. And so if I'm honest, I got to tell you this. Normally, I mean, before I was a Christian, I would just hide from these guys. I mean, I didn't answer the door, nothing like that. Knock at the door. I open the door. And they start talking. And so I'm listening very carefully because I don't really know much about the Bible. I'm not really sure about what they're trying to say. I'm not really sure what they believe. And so they're talking about Jehovah. They're talking about the scriptures. They didn't say much about Jesus. So then I'm just kind of pushing in and pressing in a little bit. And I ask one of the guys, the younger guy was doing all the talking, And I just ask him, what do you guys think about Jesus? And then the older guys kind of jumped in and I kind of discerned that they didn't really say it, but it's kind of like they believe he was just a God, not the God. And so I just said this, I just was frustrated. I I didn't know what to say. I was all nervous. My palms are sweating. And I just said, "I, I don't know what you guys believe about Jesus, but all I know is this. I believe that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. And he is the son of God and God sent him to this earth to pay the penalty of my sin. And I believe in Jesus. I've received him as my savior and Lord. I don't know what you guys think. He's seated at the right hand of God. And he said, when he was here, he just said, I and the father are one. So he is God. And then I slammed the door. (laughs) You guys are laughing. I don't know if that was really the best thing to do or not. But I, all honesty, that's what I did. And so I, I literally, I was upset with myself. I'm like, how could you do this? And so I went up to my bedroom and grabbed the Bible and I sat on the bed and I did what you, you just shouldn't do. I, I, just, I, I just asked God, I'm like, God, this was, didn't go good. Like, what, what should I do? And, and so I did the Russian roulette. Anybody want to be honest in church and say that? You did? Yeah, I can see a couple people here. You guys have done it. And, and so I literally, I, I turned, I kid you not, I turned to 2 John. And I'm, my eyes go to verse 9. And it says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And then verse 10 said, and I couldn't believe it, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked deeds. So I thought, you know what? It must not have been that bad. But seriously, think with me for a moment. 
How do you know if somebody is believing the true gospel? How do you know if somebody is teaching the true gospel? Let me take it one step further and ask, how, how do you know if you're believing the true gospel? How do you know if you're teaching and living the true gospel? That's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up to Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter one. I wanna simply give you four facts about false gospels. And the reason that I wanna do that, it's a little bit of an apologetic message because this is where the Apostle Paul goes in this letter to the Galatians. But I wanna do it because I believe, I really do, that there's many people that you lock eyes on and whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's even possibly here at church, and, and they're settling for a cheap version of Christianity. They're settling for a religion and not a relationship. They're settling for a guilt-ridden, works-driven faith. By guilt-ridden and works-driven, I simply mean this, and maybe you can identify with this, because I certainly can that by works driven, it was like, I didn't know when I did enough to try to earn favor with God. Anybody been there? And, and it's just like, I'm just trying, and you're on that treadmill, and you never know when you're done enough, and that's why it's, that's why it's guilt-ridden, because you're not sure, and you feel this false guilt, and you never know when you've done enough. And then I would say it's fear schmitten. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, you have an inaccurate view of who God is because you think he's a God who, who's angry at you and upset with you because you're not doing everything that you can when, in fact, we have a loving God who cares for us and loves us. Let's take a look at verse 6 of Galatians chapter 1. Paul writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. There it is, different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel Contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I now trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that it contains. Thank you that as we open up your word, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Lord, give us faith today as we open up your word. I pray for each person that's here in the building and those that are watching online. I just would ask, Lord, that you would meet with us, that you would guide us. And no matter where we've been, maybe you've been to this letter many times before, and this is a reminder for you. Or maybe you're wondering and, and not sure, haven't been to this letter before. I pray for all of us to take the next step of faith as it comes to worshiping you and honoring you. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. First fact about false gospels. False gospels demean grace. It, it just demeans it. And so look with me at verse six. We're gonna go right through these five verses together. Paul says, I'm astonished. What he means by that is I'm, I'm bewildered. I, I can't believe what's happening, that you so quickly are deserting him. Now the him there isn't talking about Paul. The hymn there is talking about God and deserting. If you were to double click on deserting in the original language, it's this idea of changing allegiance. I mean, changing, if you could think of it this way, that a soldier would change sides in the middle of a battle. Never happened. How about an athlete? That an athlete would change teams after the first half. I hope that doesn't happen with the Tennessee Titans today. But, but that's never gonna happen. I mean, it, you wouldn't do it. It's changing allegiance. And so that's what these were doing. That's why Paul got out his pen in somewhere between 48 to 55 AD. He wrote to the churches in Galatia. That's what it says in the opening verses. Those are churches that he planted. Those are churches that he preached at. 
And he had a word for them. He wanted to warn them. And so just as he warned them, I don't think it's off base for me to warn you that false gospels exist. And so let me quickly identify three false gospels that I think all of us are familiar with. Grant me a little leeway to understand what I'm saying. First one we know for sure, it's grace plus works. How many people know what I'm talking about? It's grace plus works. And so it's this idea that if I continue to do this and, and I work and I, I add things to the cross and to salvation, that's what we're truly saying. We're almost saying this, that, that Jesus' sacrifice is not enough. I mean, I'm waiting for the lightning bolt to hit me on this stage after I say that. That, that that's what was happening in these churches in Galatia. And so again, Paul's the one that wrote this letter. And what he was doing was he was sharing the gospel. And I mean, people were coming to Christ in droves. So the backdrop of this is that you got Jews being saved, you got Gentiles being saved. All these people are coming to Christ. And then there's this group, which you're probably familiar with, especially if you have a study Bible, the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were doing what? They were the ones that were adding things to the gospel. They were telling the Gentiles that, I can't even believe this, hey, you just came to Christ? Yep, I did. I'm a 36-year-old guy. You need to get circumcised. What? That's what was happening. I don't want to go into any more detail. But they were talking about adding things to the gospel just like we add things, whether it's service at church, whether it's given to church, whether it's church attendance, whether whatever it is. And so for them, it was the strict adherence to the Mosaic law and so that's what the Judaizers were doing to those who were Gentiles. And, and that is grace plus work. And I remember when I was, I don't know, I had just become a Christian. And my, I was at a Christmas party, big Italian family. We all get together on New Year's Eve. And, and I mean, there's food, there's everything. Everybody's there. I'm standing in the middle of the room and my cousin comes up to me and he says, Ronnie, I heard you became a Christian. And you know, I'm like, oh gosh, where's this going? And he says, and I heard you're going to seminary too. And then he just started talking to me and I felt like, have you ever been in that situation where you feel like all eyes are on you and the spotlight's on you? Anybody been there? I mean, that's what I felt. And I'm like, I got all the family members, everybody's looking at me and we're ready to go to midnight mass at midnight. And, and he and he just said to me, he goes, well, he goes, I just believe that if the good outweighs the bad, then I'm going to be okay with God. That's grace plus works. And that's what Paul's talking about here with the Judaizers. And the scripture says, for it is by grace we've been saved through faith, not a result of works that no one should boast. Second, false gospel. How about this one? It's grace times works. And so think with me for a moment. Because by grace times works, I'm talking about this idea that, yes, you say, oh, yes, I know. I mean, this is pretty simple so far. I know that I'm saved by grace. But see, some people think we're saved by grace and then sanctified by works. Did you hear what I said? So that we're saved by grace, sanctified by works, or that we're gonna change ourselves through our own efforts and through positive mental attitude. And that what? That, that I come to Christ because he paid the penalty for my sin and his sacrifice is enough, but now it's time for me to pick up myself by my own bootstraps and change myself, change that behavior, get rid of that bad habit. And how many people would be honest with me today? And in the bottom of your heart, say, I tried that. It doesn't work. Anybody? I mean, you, you can't. You, you can't change yourself. And so that's what I mean by grace times works. And Titus says in Titus chapter 2, he makes it very clear. It says in Titus chapter 2, for it is the grace of God that what? that has appeared bringing salvation for all people. That's the 
saved part by grace, but then look what he says about grace. He says it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. That's what grace does. It trains us to announce those things and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. What does that, you tell me? Grace. Okay, we'll just try that one more time because I'm not sure if we got it. Can sense a lot of people still trying to change themselves, and I'm here to warn you that it's not gonna work. Amen? So let me try that again. I don't know, I like to talk at you. I like when you talk back. It actually makes me feel like you're paying attention. What is it that changes us? It's grace. And that grace, it's that unmerited favor. And it's what we don't deserve. And grace is getting what I don't deserve, right? And it's just simply an unmerited thing. And mercy is not getting what I do deserve. That's grace. Let me give you another one. Faith, faith, we'll flash it up on the screen, false gospels. Faith minus works. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus' half-brother, James, he says it so clearly. He talks about faith, and he talks about works, and he says faith without works is dead. He says that in James chapter two. And so this idea that, Faith without works is dead. What does that mean to you and I? Well, faith, it's not a prerequisite. It isn't to what? To being saved. That grace is not a prerequisite. That what? Grace flows through, and that's how we are saved. And so what he's saying, I always like to say it like this. Faith, if it hasn't changed me, it hasn't saved me. And so what do I mean by that? Well, that God wants to make some changes in you as a result of his grace. Works are a byproduct of what? Of faith. They're not a prerequisite to faith. They are a byproduct so that what? That our faith is meant to change us. Second fact about false gospels. False gospels distort truth. That's what Paul says next. And so if you look with me at verse seven, he makes it very clear. He says, not that there's another one, another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and they want to distort the truth, uh, the gospel of Christ. So what is the gospel of Christ, I ask? It is the gospel of grace. So here we see grace being mentioned again. And so grace is mentioned two times in the opening part of this letter. It's mentioned nine times throughout the letter. I mean, it's all about grace. Grace is what changes us. Grace is what saves us. I love a couple quotes, some of my favorites, about grace. And so Philip Yancey, he writes this. Grace does not depend on what we've done for God, but rather what God has done for us. Ask people what they must do to get to heaven, and most reply, be good. Jesus' stories contradict that answer. All we must do is cry for help. He goes on to say, I love this, he understands humility. He says, grace like water flows to the lowest part. Don't you love that sweater? (laughs) I mean, but isn't it true? It's humility, man. And he's just so humble. And then let me quote Dwight D.L. Moody, who started a church in Chicago that still bears his name. He was an evangelist, and he said it like this for us to understand grace. He said, a man can no longer take in a supply of grace for the future than he can eat enough today to last him for the next six months. Nor can he inhale sufficient air into his lungs with one breath to sustain life for for what? For a week to come. We are permitted to draw upon God's store of grace from day to day as we need it. That's grace. And it's all about grace. That's what Paul is telling us. And when it says in verse seven that they distorted the gospel, that they were distorting the gospel, the truth about grace, and that word, it literally means to make something unrecognizable. And so it's this idea, if you were to go to a fun house and you look into that crazy mirror, right? And and what does it do? It makes the person with long legs like me appear to have short legs. It makes a person with a big nose like me look like a little, I have a little nose. That's why I like looking into it. But it distorts your body parts and it makes you look foolish. And that's 
exactly what's happening when we misunderstand these truths that I'm talking about today. Now, I know this message you're saying, I brought this guy in from Chicago. I mean, the marriage conference was okay, and, but, I mean, this is pretty basic, and I, I don't know if this really relates to us here. And, I mean, we're in, you know, this, is this really relate? I mean, I mean, does it? I mean, it does in Chicago. Like, we got a lot of issues with this. We got a lot of people that believe a lot of different things. You say, well, I don't think they believe that here. Well, hold on for one moment. <laughs> as I flew into your wonderful airport and as I went down that street, what's that street where they have all the restaurants and all the bars? What's it called? Bar. What is it called again? Bar. Oh, I've never been there. Have you been there a lot? You must have been there last night. <laughs> is that where you guys were? I've never seen it. Yes, exactly. I picked something up. I'm not going to lie to you. I was there. And this is a little product that they're selling here in Nashville for everyone. It's a product called Wash Away My Sins. <laughs> and so it's hand soap. So sorry about that, guys. We want to get that on there. It's Wash Away My Sins. What it says is it kills sin on contact. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it is so good. And look at the pastor there. He looks so spiritual. He has really small biceps, so we know that's not your pastor. <laughs> And then look what it says. It says it, it reduces guilt by 98.9%. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, let's go. Line up after the service. I bought a whole truckload. We're all set. I mean, that's all we need. And then just to make matters worse, let's look at the back. It says, tempting, do it again, Easter lily scent. <laughs> just so we understand how to apply this. Number one, press pump. Number two, anoint palms. Number three, <laughs> Rub hands together piously. <laughs> number four, rinse. Number five, repent. And then number six, go forth cleansed from sin, ready to do it again. <laughs> We're laughing. But I think Paul's right on target, isn't he? And, and we've kind of made it a joke about the grace of God. And so again, my heart is this, that I just think that there's a lot of people who are misunderstanding or misapplying. People who don't understand what it means to come to Christ and experience that grace that saves. But then also Christians who think that it's by their works and not grace, that grace is the thing that fills us, that enables us to be free from sin, to walk in his steps with him, alongside of him, and doing what? Renouncing ungodliness, as it says in Titus. It's about grace. And we sing about that grace. And it is so wonderful. It is so beautiful. So let me tell you about the next thing that we do. And we're talking about facts today. And so what's the, what's the third fact about false gospels? Well, false gospels damage lives. And so we see that word accursed. We see it two times in these next two verses. And what's interesting, it literally means doomed to destruction. And so that Greek word is used six times in the New Testament. It's not a good picture. The idea is that you're doomed, you're doomed to destruction. And what, if we misunderstand this, if we don't teach this right, if we don't get this right with the people around us, I had the privilege of speaking to a bunch of church planters. These are um, churches that have been planted in the last five years or less. And so we're partnered together, our church, High Point Church, which is a church in the uh, western suburbs of Chicago. And as was announced, uh, Jody and I started that church 23 years ago. And uh, we're still there, and God's doing some amazing things. And we plant churches, your church plants churches, and we do it together. So we work with the Send Network. And so we're planting churches, amen, because we want to see the gospel go forth. So I got to spend um, some time with uh, about 400 church planters and their spouses back in Washington, D.C. last week, and we were talking about this very thing. And what I told them is this, hey, man, there's some things you could, you could get wrong in ministry. I mean, you could mispronounce, you know, somebody's name at a wedding. Like, you can get that wrong. I know, you know, we, it happens. You could even, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, but you could even drop the communion cups. I mean, you can do that. You could even do this. You could even use your kid 
in an illustration without their permission. I know Robbie's done that. (laughs) But you can't get this wrong. Because you can't get this wrong because we're accursed. I mean, we're doomed to destruction. That what we cannot get this wrong, not I as a pastor, not you as a follower of Christ. So here's the false gospel formula. I just want to make it really clear. I've talked about what some of the false gospels are that demean grace, but here's the formula. It's simple as can be. Please allow the Lord to write this on your heart. Jesus plus anything. Jesus plus anything. I mean, if it's Jesus plus, it's a false gospel. Jesus plus anything else. And this would include, but it's not limited to. Let's just go down the list. Jesus plus vote like me. Politics. And isn't it true that we expect people to be just like we are? And silence hit the crowd because I just hit a core. (laughs) But isn't it true? It's not Jesus plus politics. It's not Jesus plus worship like I want. Like I want you to worship like I do. Personal preferences. And so God calls us. God does some things. It's not that it's not Jesus plus worship like I want. Or how about this one? Jesus plus change what I want. And here I'm talking about unrealistic expectations that you may have for someone who just became a Christian or that what? That I may have and that we expect changed behavior from people. Why aren't you over that yet? How come you're still doing that? Are, are you kidding me? I'm like, you're a follower of Christ. You come here long, how, what? You still? And isn't it interesting to me that the same person that's saying that, and I know it's because it's true of me, that God was so patient with you waiting for you to change, wasn't he? For that behavior, for that that struggle, for that sin. And how can we be so impatient with other people when God was so patient for us? Amen? It's true. And so we just gotta be careful. And yes, God is changing people. He does it. He does it on his timetable. He does it as we surrender to other. I've been saying like this at our church for a long time. We can't expect regenerate behavior from unregenerated hearts. Did you hear what I said? Like we can't expect the world or the community or the circle of influence that you have at work or at school. Yes, I know we're swimming upstream. Yes, I know the culture is against what God's word says, but how can we expect unregenerate behavior from unregenerated hearts? They don't have the power to change. They don't have the Holy Spirit within. So. I'm not saying we're to expect it, but I'm not saying let's not be so surprised with the world that we're living in that we hold the answer. It's Christ, and it's the gospel. But Jesus plus anything. How about this next one? Jesus plus my church traditions. That's pharisaical thinking and behavior. How about let's just go down the list. Jesus plus my effort. It's pride and self-reliance. The other idea that I'm gonna change myself, that I'm gonna be able to do it. Am I hitting a chord here? How about Jesus plus pride? And that what? That my pride, my self-effort, Jesus plus my effort, the reliance on self. And then lastly, Jesus minus, listen closely, Jesus minus Savior and Lord. What do I mean by that? If we do that, we can't subtract out who Jesus is. When we do that, we just make him an ordinary man. We make him a good teacher. We make him just a nice guy. What is the true gospel? You, you know, you, you're talking about what it isn't. Like, what is it exactly? Well, let me be clear. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything, man. He changes lives. He does things that are out of control. I mean, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in him as we, as we study his word and as we surrender ourselves to him. It's interesting to me, a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna recommit my life to Jesus. And I know what you mean, and, and please, I understand your heart, but nowhere in the New Testament does it say that we're to recommit. What it says is that we're to surrender more of ourselves. And so what are you surrendering to Jesus who is Savior? 
Jesus who is Lord. Hey, be careful, words matter. You don't make Jesus Lord. Are you hearing me? You don't make Jesus Lord because Jesus already is Lord. He is the Lord of this world. And, and we gotta embrace and surrender ourselves to him being Lord of our lives. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Last, what I'm calling fact about false gospels, and you could have got this message yourself. It's all right here. Look what Paul says next. For Now am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Well, the last fall gospel is this. Paul's walking around it. He gets really personal now, and false gospels divide hearts. That's what they do. They divide allegiance. They divide your heart. What Paul's saying here is if, if I'm just more concerned about pleasing others than pleasing God, then I'm not a servant of Christ. If I'm more fearful of others than, than I am fearful of God, then I'm not pleasing Christ. If I'm doing this, if I'm too concerned about what people think of me, the people in my surroundings, the people that you know, and I'm not concerned about what God thinks and what his word says, then, then I'm not a servant of Christ. So there it is. Those are the false gospels. Those are the things that trip us up. Aren't you thankful for the true gospel? The gospel of grace. Jesus plus everything. I mean, please plus nothing. It, it is everything to me. Yesterday, we, Jody and I had the privilege of being on this stage and telling our story about our marriage. And I won't tell you the whole story, but just for those who didn't hear, I'll just share a few pieces that, that we didn't grow up in Christian homes. And we dated throughout uh, high school and college. And, and then, you know, it was like, I don't know, we were the last of our friends to get married. She had a job out east, and she was doing awesome, unbelievable. I was in the Midwest. And, and so Chicago was the place that we moved, and we got married. And that first year of marriage, it was like we crashed and burned. Anybody ever been there? I mean, we crashed and burned. And it was so bad that within eight months, Jody, she wanted to get a divorce. And so she wanted to divorce me because I was doing some things that I shouldn't have been doing. And how she would say it, if she was on this stage, she'd say, I wasn't doing some things that I could have been doing. And so after the worst night of our lives, Jody got up one morning, and again, we didn't go to church. We weren't part of a church. We weren't Christians. And she put on a dress, and I'm just I'm looking at her. I'm like, what are you doing? Where are you going? And she's like, I'm going across the street to church. And so she walked over to this little church. And interestingly, the first person she met was an Asian woman. And this Asian woman, she had a really um, thick, heavy accent. And so Jody had to verbalize what had just gone on. And so the tears, you know, it's the first time she would verbalize, tears are coming in her eyes, and this woman's crying with her. And this lady with her thick accent, she just said, she goes, my husband, he a failure too. <laughs> so husbands, just raise your hand and identify yourselves for me. I, I just want to see you. Thank you for your honesty. And then she said this. She said, she said well, you know, she said, um, you need to go with this thick axe. You need to go to Widow Creek. Widow Creek. And she was talking about this Willow Creek. Have you heard of that church? And, 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 and Jody thought she said widow. And then Jody thought, you know, I thought about killing him last night, but I didn't think that was a good idea. And then this is the new part for those who've heard the story. This woman said, she said, you need to go there, though, with your whole heart. Don't go there with a half heart. Go there with a the whole heart of what God could do. And, and we went to that place. And we met with a pastor. And he presented the true gospel. And we both looked at each other with tears in our eyes. And, and we became Christians in the same prayer, in the same moment, at the same time, in the same place. And God set a new trajectory for our lives that, that I couldn't have possibly imagined. That's what the gospel does, amen? The gospel moves us. And it changes us, and it shapes us. If you would just do this, bow your heads with me. Take a moment before we join the worship team, and just take a moment and reflect upon the true gospel. And maybe the truth of the matter is there's, 
there's some aspects of some false gospels that have entered into your thinking. And, and just take a moment between you and God and confess those right now. And if you're here today or maybe watching online, and maybe you're like me, and you, you didn't understand the true gospel and what Jesus did for you. The scripture says that all we need to do is to admit that we're sinners. And you can do that right now in this moment. And the scripture says that we're to believe in Jesus and to believe in the sacrifice that he made for us. And it's as simple as ABCs that we would admit, that we would believe, that we would confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And you can do that even here right now. Allow the Lord to speak with you. The psalmist says, twice I heard God and once he spoke meaning that God's words just echoed in our minds. And so, Father, I pray for your word to steer us and guide us. I thank you for the truth of who you are. We praise you now, Lord, for your son, Jesus, and the impact that he has made and the impact that he is making. If you agree with that prayer, say it.